Dr. Francis, how are you? Hi, Terry. I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm good, thanks. It's a bit chilly. Very chilly. And winter is coming. Yeah, or here already. Christmas is just around the corner. I know, I know. I've, I've seen so many house lit, houses lit up with the Christmas lights outside. Yeah, there's lots around here. I think people have had such a rough year. Yeah, what, true. Get a sparkle, don't we? Maybe a bit true. earlier than usual. Yeah, yeah, true, yeah. But um, must be rich, though, I think, with the, the cost of electricity and power <laughs> yeah. supplies these days. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be skinned by Christmas. Yeah. Well, there's even something dodgy with the electricity. <laughs> so before we talk about your book, uh, The Smallest Man, we talk about your background, your journalist career. Yeah, so um, I was a journalist for, well, straight out of university, really. I started off in trade magazines, not very exciting <laughs> The, yeah. the kind of thing, the kind of thing that pops up on "Have I Got News for You?" Oh yeah. So yeah, so you know when they do, I don't know, Bridge and Bridge and Tunnels International or any of those magazines. I worked on education equipment and chemist and druggist. Oh, and, heavy. Yeah, yeah. So, but they're they're more interesting than you think. But but not a journalist's dream job, obviously. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then I worked in women's magazines. Went freelance about twenty years ago. Yeah. Now I do sort of mix, I do a bit of journalism, not so much of that these days, and I do quite a lot of copywriting. Yeah. So if you've bought a pizza from Waitrose, you will have my words in your fridge. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you say freelancing, does that mean you're sort of, you're a standalone, you're self-employed? And these yes. people, do they, yes. do they give you a commission? Do you have to yeah, sort of pitch maybe. for it or...? generally in journalism it's it's a mix of both and yeah. it's really these days it's really tough if you're pitching for work it's very yeah. very difficult you can spend you know you might do six pitches and get a job from one of them and yeah. they all take quite a lot of time to do so I kind of have moved out of that a bit now um whereas the, the copywriting work I do it comes regularly and yeah, yeah. it's it's, a, it's a, a bit of an easier life really yeah so in effect then you're a full-time writer aren't you that, that's your, that's your yeah, career I'm, I'm always writing something so I might yeah. be writing I might be working on one of my books in the morning and yeah. then I might be writing pizza packaging in the afternoon <laughs> what, do you, what do you put on it are you told what to say or do you have to come up with some kind of tagline it's a bit of both so so really it's basically um it might be the name of a range um so I might then they'll give me an idea what they want to get across and then I'll have to kind of think of some catchy name often it's just you know literally the description that makes you pick up the product so yeah. it's, it's describing what's what that pizza's made of what's on the top of it and making it sound delicious okay. but within quite strict legal limits yeah so you can't be misleading. So yeah, and and then also within a tiny space. Yeah. So it's quite a challenge, but I like it. Sometimes it makes you hungry. Sometimes if you're writing something really nice and yep. uh, think, oh yeah, I fancy that pizza. Also things like here, uh, straight straight from the lips to the hips. That type of thing is it? <laughs> Not quite that. It tends to be more um, slow cooked beef topped with buttery mash. That sounds tasty. It'd be easy jet. Easy yeah. jet, sorry. Yeah, yeah, did the easy, easy jet brochure. Yeah, it's funny what things sort of come up because people sort of recommend you and then you suddenly get a call from someone. I've done a chocolate firm. I used to do a lot of toiletries and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, you have to be quite versatile, really, because, you know, you're making a living at the end of the day, so you have That's to true. deliver what people want. Just being a novelist, does that help on your CV? Does that open doors for you? I think um, not so much but it does kind of it does kind of impress people a bit I guess yeah, yeah. yeah. which it, you know it really shouldn't because they're two completely different skills but I'm mm. not gonna argue okay how, how, how did the, so you got the background in journalism does that help with your edits you know um yeah it really most does. people speak to you know they go through you know 50 different edits but if you've got sort of edited discipline in the back of your head anyway yeah, I mean, I still go through the edits like everybody else, but I suppose things like, for example, you know, I think when I, I I've just um, submitted book to my second book, and I had to cut twenty thousand words. What? And most people, you know, twenty thousand words from one hundred and twenty thousand. So what's that? A sixth? And a lot of people would freak out at that, but yeah. I'm used to it. I know I, I quite often have to write a story that's three hundred words long. Yeah. So I'm used to making every word count and being able to twist a sentence a bit so it says the same thing, but in half as many words. So I actually like that bit. I like the cutting the 20,000 words. It's a nice challenge. And I don't normally have to cut a scene or a chapter. I'll normally um, say, OK, I'll go through and I'll cut 20 words from every page. Yeah. And you nearly always can and it nearly always improves things. So, yeah, I think that skill, that skill is really useful. 
Okay. The second one was just the bone setter. Yeah, that bone setter woman. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Comes out in August. Oh, brilliant. Schuster. Yeah, Simon Schuster. So basically when um, when the smallest man sold, it was a two book deal. Okay. So, yeah, so I knew that I would be able to write another one for them, which is, you know, as a debut author is, is lovely to know that you're not just going to have one out there, but they want another one from you. So, yeah, yeah that's really nice. Going back a few years, were you on, you were on the Curtis Brown? They do like a sort of a yeah. mentoring scheme, a mentoring session. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a writing course, actually. They do, they do lots of different ones. I was on the six-month one, yeah. um, and it was in the days when you actually could go to courses. I think they do uh, them all yeah. online at the moment. Yeah, yeah. And so basically, um, I was living in Kent at the time, and got the train up to London. So it, was some, it was sort of alternate weeks, one night or two nights. And you'd have kind of writing classes. But we also had a lot of authors, a lot of editors, a lot of agents came to speak to us. Yeah. So you got a really good insight into the industry and what people were looking for. Yeah. And that was incredibly valuable. The, the writing tuition was, it makes you do it and it makes you think about things, but it was more getting that insight into the industry. I mean, I, I think the thing that I learned there that was most valuable, we had um, Nathan Finer who wrote the, um, the Shock of the Fall, which was a Costa Prize winning book. Yeah. And he came along. And he was saying, he was talking about edits, actually. And he said that the manuscript that he got an agent, got, that got him an agent, um, he reckoned between that manuscript and the one that was published, 95% of the words were different. What? what? And that, yeah, that, yeah, that's what I thought at the time. Incredible. Thought, yeah. Come on, mate. <laughs> that yeah. can't be true. But now I know, yeah, that could easily be true. Yeah. And it kind of showed me how much you could change a book when you think it's done yeah. and how much more you can do to it. So, yeah, that was really useful. Okay. I, I've spoken to a writer. Um, he, his novel basically set around Liverpool, Liverpool characters. And he said right. he, he was in talk with the publisher, but they wanted to change the city. They wanted it to be set in London, I think. But oh, I think yeah. the, the whole gist of the novel, the whole theme, you know, all about Liverpool and Liverpool signs and Liverpool streets and Liverpool Make characters. It, book, it was a different it? book, a wholly yeah. different, different theme. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did yeah, you... well, I, I, I did have, an, uh, not quite as bad as that, but so my my book, The Smallest Man, as, as you probably know, is based on the, a true story of yeah. a guy called Jeffrey Hudson. Yeah. And Jeffrey Hudson, towards about two thirds of the way through his life, was captured by pirates and he became <laughs> a slave in Morocco. Yeah. And yeah. my book originally, the character who's based on Jeffrey Hudson called Nat Davey, that happened to him too. Yeah. And the book that sold to Simon & Schuster had that, that the last third was about yeah. him being a slave in Morocco. Yeah. And after it sold, my editor said, I don't think this bit works. Hmm. Can you come up with a completely different last third of the book? Oof. And that was, yeah, there was, there was a moment when I thought I'm going to have to say, even if this means you can't take the book. No, yeah. I can't. I can't think how to do it, but, but you do. And the, and the book is better for it. So oh. I think sometimes those big changes are good, but yeah, if you've yeah. got a sense of place, that's that's yeah. quite hard to move it somewhere else. Yeah, so you can't be too precious about it then. You, you, you can't. Let, you have, you have to open. trust they, they know what they're talking about. Through. So yeah. yeah. Let's, let's talk about your book. Yeah, there was some Nat Davy. Was it a purposeful choice for the, the title of the name, Nat? You know, tiny insect? No, 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 actually. A few people said that to me later on, and it, it really wasn't. Um, I just originally I was going to call him Jeffrey Hudson and I was going to make a fictionalized version of Jeffrey Hudson's story. Yeah. I just couldn't get on with the name. I just kept thinking, <laughs> Jeffrey Hudson, like he sounded like an accountant from Guildford. <laughs> and I just I couldn't get on with it at all. Yeah. And I thought, well, okay, I'm gonna. I read another book. Um uh, where someone had done a fictionalised version of a real character. And I thought, yeah, I'll give that a try. And as soon as I came up with the name, yeah. it, all, it all started to come alive. And yeah. yeah, his name is actually Nathaniel. So it's just, it's, I think I just Googled 17th century boys' names and chose Nathaniel. But yeah, yeah. maybe subconsciously. Well, that you know, was... It stays with you, that that name. I mean, if, if, I, if it would have been Jeffrey Hilton, I'm looking at my notes and I would have had to look at the notes to remember that name. <laughs> exactly. But Nat, Nat Davy, you know, he's there. So yeah, tell us yeah. about he's, he's the smallest, the smallest man. So tell tell us a bit about it. Obviously, no. Yeah. So, um, so it's based on the story of Geoffrey Hudson, who was court dwarf to Queen Henrietta Maria, who was the wife of Charles I. He's given as a pet. Yeah, pretty much a human pet. So he was basically presented to her in a pie, which what? is 
Yeah, in a, in a big pastry case. That was a the the, the um, nursery rhyme. Five and twenty blackbirds baked in a pie yeah. is the same. They were forever baking things, but they didn't bake them. They put them into a pastry case, yeah. and then you take the lid off, and a surprise would be inside. And that happened to Jeffrey Hudson when he was about ten. And then what fascinated me about him was he was given to her as a human pet, and he wasn't the only one she had. She had two or three dwarves and then she had a guy who was described as a giant it was obviously just very tall yeah. and that she had this almost human menagerie but what was peculiar was reading on 10 years later 20 years later when the civil war broke out he jeffrey hudson was still there yeah. i thought well that's not the relationship of someone to a human pet but there must have been some kind of friendship there so that was kind of where the idea for tracing that story began really I thought what must that relationship have been because they were quite close in age um Jeffrey Hudson was given to her when he was 10 or 11 and she was only 15 at the time she had just got married just come over from France didn't speak English must have been horrendously lonely yeah. and so I figured that maybe that was where the friendship had come from that he was homesick and out of place so was she yeah. and clearly something came out of that okay this is set with the background of the, the English Civil War, what, 1630, that, that time mm -hmm. period. How much research did you put into this? Was that a I massive effort? I had to do loads. And the yeah. thing was, I, I studied the English Civil War for A-level history, yeah. and I absolutely hated it. It's boring, bit boring, nice, I found. So boring, so yeah. boring. <laughs> Just full of stuff about politics yeah. and religion. I mean, it didn't help that I didn't much like the teacher and she wasn't very fond of oh, me. Yeah. But Big it difference. did give me... Yeah, it did give me bad memories of the Civil War. So people have said to me, what attracted you to writing about the Civil War? Absolutely nothing. Yeah. It was just that that happened to be when Jeffrey Hudson's story took place. Okay. Yeah. So I researched it, but I suppose what I found out was, yeah, there is all this religious stuff, the religious factions, the political factions, mm. but quite a lot of the cause of the Civil War came down to the Queen because she was Catholic. People thought she was going to turn the King. And so there was this personal story at the heart of it that I don't remember ever being mentioned in my A-level class. Yeah. So then I thought, well, I can focus on that. And because the story's first person, I only needed to talk about what Nat was there for. Yeah, yeah. So if Nat wasn't there in all these boring meetings about politics, yeah. Yeah. well, we didn't need to know about it either. I mean, it's yeah. there, yeah. he explains what's going on, but I'd like to, I like to think it's, if you'd bumped into the real Nat, and, you know, years later, he'd started telling you his life story. It's the things he would leave in yeah. and not the things he wouldn't bother to tell you because they're boring. Yeah, that's a great technique, I think, to sort of cut out chunks of it, you know, with this, not mm -hmm. some vision, but just from his personal, his own point of view. Yeah, I just talked about the things that I thought he would remember and just enough background so that people know what's going on. I and mean, people said to me, you know, I've really learned a lot. Well, I've learned a lot as well. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay. It looks like you, you had a great success with this. How many reviews? What, two, about 250 reviews you've got this on Amazon? Yeah, so that's Superb. quite good. And I was really lucky with press. I had reviews in all the tabloids, yeah, the Sunday Times, lots of magazines. So so that was really, really nice. So, yeah, it's it, it's I mean, everyone gets a few dodgy reviews. <laughs> yeah. some clear ones, everyone does. It makes the um, good ones look uh, more genuine, doesn't it? It does, yeah. yeah. And the, the good ones have been... More than good in the sense that people say things like, you know, I'll remember Nat for a long time or I missed him when I finished the book. Yeah. And that kind of, that's lovely when people say that kind yeah. of thing. I started reading it today, actually, the first couple of chapters. Um, right. it's sort, of, it, it sort of immediately, you know, he appeals. You know, you, you're on his side. You know, the, not, I'm, gonna say, I'm not going to say the little man. Um, you know, no, no. Wolf, regardless of that, he's a child. And you just feel yeah, for him. Yeah, he's a child at the beginning and he's yeah. vulnerable. And I knew that it had to be that way. I knew that there would have to be, you would kind of have to fall in love with him quite early on. And then that would carry you through the rest of the story. And, and okay. luckily, you do. Yeah, yeah. Sleep. Well, um, I, I look, well, I've done, obviously, I've done a bit of research on yourself. Is there any kind of film deal on the horizon at all? No, television? there is there no. isn't which um everybody says this would make a great film yeah um but so far nothing but but apparently it's something that doesn't always happen straight away hmm. sometimes you know filmmakers will wait and see how a book goes hmm. so yeah I'm, I'm still hopeful I, it would be great if it happened but it's kind of out of my hands really okay 
Have, have you, as part of your research, did you look at novels like like the, the Shardley series of novels, C.S. Samson, you know, the, read those. Henry VIII, about 100 years before your period? But so good. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've been a big fan of those for a long time. And in fact, funnily enough, I started writing a, a murder mystery set around the time of the Great Plague, really because I liked those Shard Lake stories so much. Yeah. And I yeah. thought, can I do something like that? Yeah. And it was when I was researching that book, which which is still in a drawer somewhere, yeah. um, that I came across the story of Jeffrey Hudson. So, oh, okay. yeah, it's a kind of but I would really like. I, in fact, I did come across that uh, my plague murder mystery recently and thought, I might have another go and see if I can make that work. I love a historical murder mystery. They're so yeah. good. Because yeah. it's so good when you haven't got mobile phones yeah. and you yeah. haven't got a police force. Mm. You can just be so much more creative. Yeah, you send a letter and you get a reply three weeks later. Exactly. Or if, if, if yeah. you're on Game of Thrones, you've got a crow, you know, can fly away, and come back in <laughs> yeah. half an hour. <laughs> so, yeah. so sad to him. <laughs> what, what else are you reading? Are you, do you have a favourite? Is it historical fiction? That you, is that no, what, I, I do read a lot. I read a lot of historical fiction lately because what ha- tends to happen once you get a book published, which is a lovely thing, yeah. is publishers start sending you books and asking you to read oh. them in the hope that, you know, you'll provide a quote for the cover. And what they tend to do, you know, obviously, this is my first book. I'm not a big name. I'm not any kind of a name. Yeah. And so what they do is they send the books to the big names, yeah. but then they also send them to people who are quite a long way down their list. So mostly your quote never gets on the cover. Occasionally they have, but but you still get a nice book to read. So, yeah, so, I, so and often it is historical fiction that I get sent. But, yeah, I read all sorts. I read a lot of crime. A uh, brilliant series I've read recently is um, by a guy called Trevor Wood, who writes, uh, she's, he's written a trilogy yeah. of murder, well, crime thrillers. Yeah. And the protagonist, the, the detective, if you like, is a homeless man. He's a homeless oh. ex-soldier. That's different. And so, yeah, and he they're set in Newcastle. And he the, in the first one, he witnesses a murder. Yeah. But because of who, he's, who he is, the police are like, yeah, right, mate, on your bike sort of yeah. thing. Yeah. And so he decides to investigate himself. And so, yeah, I love those. I love crime thrillers because they, I like I like reading them anyway, but they teach you how to write a page turner. They mm. teach you how to make the people want to finish a chapter and then they've got to read the next one before they turn the light off. So yeah. they're really useful. Yeah, I read all sorts. Hmm. Do, do, have you got a, a reading and a writing routine? Have you got a little room there in your house in, in- Brighton is it Brighton you're from in, Brighton and Hove? In, yeah, in Brighton, yeah, in, well, in Hove, yeah. So I have normally I have my own office because obviously I've been working from home for a long yeah. time. Yeah. We're having the house is being sort of remodeled at the moment because we bought a bit of a wreck. Mm. So we're currently living and working pretty much in this room. So it's a bit tricky at the moment. Um, but yeah, normally I have my own office and I tend to write in the mornings because I find that. You know, with a book, you're on a very long deadline. Mm. It's really easy to say, oh, I won't do it today. I'll do yeah. some tomorrow. Whereas my other work, usually, if I'm writing it on a Monday, someone needs it on a Tuesday. Yeah. So I know that I can, if I do the work in the morning, the, the day job has to be done. So yeah. I do that in the afternoon for as long as it takes. So that works pretty well for me to do it that way around. That's the bread and butter stuff coming in. Yeah, yeah, well, you have to, you have to do it. You know, you yeah. have to pay the bills. People are quite surprised to find out how little you earn from writing novels. Yeah. Um, but I know that I have to do the book work first, or that will be the thing that gets shoved aside because someone's waiting for the rest. Yeah. What what's, what's like the ideal for a two book deal? Do you have like do you have like an end date? You know, is that set in stone, or you know, is it leeway? Is, is no. There's, I think there's always leeway, and then you know, with the pandemic and lockdowns deadlines moved all over the place so so the smallest man got moved twice to avoid yeah. lockdowns and still ended up coming out into closed bookshops yeah. um and yeah with my second book I got the deadline moved by about six months just because it took longer to write than I thought yeah. and usually there's a fair amount of leeway okay can we talk about your, your second novel to, to be published the bone set of woman incredible name again endurance proudfoot this is the main yeah, character no. where would you get that yeah. from I got, well, I got Proudfoot from an electrician who was working what? on our house. Yeah, I thought you were Native, Native American. Yeah, his name was, um, I didn't even realise this, but he had, I realised one day he had it on the back of his T-shirt. His name was Clint Proudfoot. What? That's I mean, like a what cowboy a name, character. Yeah, That's a... What a name is that? And I thought, oh, I could think I could do something with that. And then I wanted, um, I won't spoil it for you, but... okay. 
Endurance's name is quite important in the book. It, it had to be a, a name that worked in a certain way and it took me a long time to come up with it. But yeah, so it's, she's called Jury for short, but there's a, reason why, there's a reason why she's called Endurance that's quite important to the plot. Judge and Jury, I'm thinking of. Oh. Did, did yeah, say... Jury with a D. With a D. Ah, sorry, like, yeah, yeah, like jury, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm involved in a blog tour at the moment. No, that was when the book came out. Actually, what you you got it behind you. Actually, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm looking at it. The dates are the same, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was last. It was last year. It was just before the book came out. Do you yeah. know? With it having no year on it, and I'm thinking 26th yeah, exactly. of November. So where are you going to go next week? So this is a year. This is a year out of date. Yeah. No. Blog tours. I mean, the thing about getting a novel published the first time is. There's so much you don't know, even though you could say I've worked in publishing all my life. Book yeah. publishing is a different world. So yeah. I had no idea what a blog tour was. Yeah. And in fact, all it is, is that your publisher picks and well, a number of bloggers because uh, book bloggers are really so important now. Yeah. And they send them a copy and then they allocate them a date when they hope that the blogger will publish a review on their on their blog yeah. and yeah it kind of builds and then people often tweet about it so it kind of builds a bit of publicity for the book and it worked really well for mine the bloggers were brilliant I mean they're such they're amazing the bloggers I don't think they get the credit that they deserve really I mean they mm. do this you know in their own time yeah. they're not paid okay they get free books mm. but the amount of time and effort they put into it and how much you know if they like a book they will really get behind you. Mm. And so, so just at the moment, um, there's an online book retailer called Burt's Books, and he does a book of the year competition every year. Yeah. And it, it's a bit like, a, it's a knockout. So it starts with 32 books yeah. and there'll be, I can't, my maths is not great, but there'll be four books in each round and it's a knockout round and then you go through to the next one. So at the moment, I'm in the semi-final okay. and all the bloggers are retweeting it and saying, you know, vote for Francis. Yeah. Which, that's so nice. It's such a lovely community. I mean, people say Twitter, this is all on Twitter. People yeah. say Twitter is like a nest of vipers and it can be, mm. but book Twitter is a lovely place. People, people connect, people support mm. each other. Yeah. So that's been a real surprise. And then I think another surprise that I had was how supportive authors are of each other. Because you'd kind of think we're all in competition, but yeah. nobody really behaves like that. So I was really lucky that at the beginning of, where are we now, 2021, beginning of 2020, yeah. I found a Facebook group um, for authors who had their first books coming out in 2020. Yeah. And I think in a normal year, it probably just would have been a Facebook group. And, you know, people might have shared tips a little bit, but it yeah. never would have gone anywhere. Yeah. But because we're in such a weird year and people's, you know, the bookshop lockdown came, yeah. bookshop yeah. closed, yeah. people's first, I mean, I know people whose first books came out and they never saw it in a bookshop Ooh. because it came out in lockdown. Yeah, things but, like they planned on for years as well, you know, the yeah, big yeah, guy spoiled. Exactly. And you yeah, never see it, you know, book launches were canceled. But because of that, I think our little group really gelled and we started having a Zoom every Friday and we really got to know each other. And we've all supported each other, like everybody promotes everyone else's books, nobody competes. If one of us gets a prize, everyone's then everyone's super pre pleased instead of being jealous. Yeah. So that's been a really, really lovely thing. And actually one of the best things about being published yeah. is being in that sort of author's community. And I had no idea it would be like that. That sounds brilliant. I yeah. found that, um, well, with my book, uh, Facebook, it, it helps with book sales. There's that many yeah. different splinter groups or groups within Facebook. Like, yeah. like the area of Liverpool, you know, there's, there's groups dedicated to particular districts within Liverpool. Right. And different historical societies and so much on there. Whereas Twitter's just one big chunk, it's a big huge wedge. Yeah, you kind of you, you kind of have to find your way a bit more with Twitter. But once you do, hmm. it's it can be particularly for books. It's great. I mean, I've actually you know I've seen I've seen my books sell in front of my eyes on Twitter. Yeah. Sort of when when the book first came out, we had a special edition for yeah. independent bookshops yeah. that had green sprayed edges. It was really it was a lovely thing to look at. Yeah. And I'd get people going, oh, where can I get the independent edition? And then I would tweet, where can this person get one? And a bookshop would say, oh, I've got one. You know, what's it from me? Oh, and you know, they had no idea that that would yeah. happen. But yeah. So Twitter, I for you know for any authors just starting I'd really recommend it, it takes a while to build mm. um but you get involved in conversations and yeah. and yeah people are really nice 
Okay, that was the question I've got written down. Next, advice for, for new authors. Uh, oh, so much advice for new authors. So I think my biggest bit of advice, and I'm thinking here of people perhaps, you know, who are still writing the first book, who haven't got a deal yet, bum on seat, hmm. do it. Just keep, try and find a regular time if you can. Yep. Not everybody's life allows for that, but just just do it so many people waste time going oh I haven't got an idea that will become a bestseller or oh you know I don't I haven't got the right contacts well the single most important thing you can do to improve your chances of getting a book published is to write a book mm, yeah. finish it yeah, <laughs> and so and so many people don't and now I've done it I totally understand why they don't because it's really really hard it's hard work isn't it yeah it's hard work and it's especially hard work before you've got an agent because you have no idea if that's just going to end up in the bin or, yeah, you know, true. like my first one in the drawer. Yeah. But just stick at it. That's the main thing to do. Yeah. And then when you think you've finished it, shove it in a drawer for a month and then come back to it. Because with my second one, so I sent in my second one to my agent and my editor thinking, yeah, you know, it probably needs a few tweaks, but it's not bad. Yeah. And they came back and said, mm, pretty much change everything. And I was sort of, it, it, it knocked me for six because I thought, well, maybe I just don't know what a good book looks like anymore yeah. and don't know how to do it. And, you know, all those things that you go yeah. through. Yeah. And then I took six months, completely rewrote it. It's the same book, but it's a very different version of that book. Yeah. And sent it in thinking, oh, I'm going to have to do loads more work. And they yeah. both were like, no, we love it this time. Yeah. You've turned it round. So it's amazing how much you can do when you finish you think you finished a book yeah yeah so you always just be open to changing it mm, that's good sounds like great advice it's, been, it's rubbish they said we like it but big yes but. they say things like there is lots to love about mm. this <laughs> which you think oh is there you can't and then you think there's a big buck coming here yeah. <laughs> and i suppose the the other the advice i would give to anyone who is where i was sort of almost this time last year is enjoy it and really, really try not to move the goalposts because the minute your book comes out, there will be someone else who's sold more than you. There will be someone who's got more publicity than you. There will be someone who's got better reviews than you. And, the, and it goes on. There'll be someone who's got a book deal. There'll be someone who's sold foreign editions. And you can't, it's really difficult not to compare yourself to that. Yeah. yeah. And then to start thinking, oh, mine's rubbish. Nobody likes mine. I haven't yeah. done very well. Yeah. And, you know, that year of being a debut novelist, you'll never get it again. It's it's like, you know, it's like being unmarried. You can get divorced, but you can never not have been married. Yeah. You can't get that back again. Yeah. And just enjoy it. Just don't compare yourself to anyone else. Just remind yourself that just by getting a book published, you have done something that thousands and thousands of people would give their right arm for. And yeah, just, just enjoy it. Cause it's, yeah. it, it's an amazing experience to go through. Yeah, what an achievement. You got a special pen for when you, your book came out. You've... I have, I've got a special <laughs> gold pen. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sign it with my special pen. <laughs> I've got a special gold pen because- You say gold, I've got what gold it's color not, or gold solid. ink? Well, it is gold in color and gold ink. It's not solid what? gold, obviously. Gold um, ink? Because, well, obviously you can see there's gold on the cover, yeah, yeah, so it goes yeah. quite well. but yeah. it was mainly because my handwriting is really, really bad. And so I knew that my signature was going to be a hideous scrawl. <laughs> and I thought, well, at least a gold pen might make it look a bit festive. Oh, okay, can you see it, actually? Can you see the with gold ink? I've yeah, never seen yeah, I test, yeah, I test It's very like the gold that's behind you on the cover. So it does, it does look quite nice in the oh, book. Okay. Yeah. Who, who, did, who did who did the boot cover? Did you have a, a choice on that? Superb. I'm surprised how white it is. Most boot covers you see, you know, there's mostly a third yeah. of it's in black, black or darkness. Yeah, and, and particularly most historical fiction tends yeah, to be yeah. quite deep, rich colours. And and when we first saw it, myself and my agent, we were a bit, mm, is that going to be a bit recessive on shelf? Yeah. But it, it's not. Funnily enough, it does stand out against that. Yeah. And yeah, the, people tend to think you have a lot of say, you really have very little at all. Mm -hmm. So they, they say to you, um, yeah, we'll, we'll have lots of different options and you'll be able to give your input and all this. Mm -hmm. And then the email comes and it says... Well, we found a cover and we really like it and, and we hope you do too. And the subtext is just try turning this oil tanker around lately. 
but as it happened you know I loved it yeah. and it it's it drew a lot of attention to the book mm. so I'm I'm really grateful for it it did it did a lot of heavy lifting for me basically a lot of people picked it up who might not have looked at historical fiction otherwise so yeah, yeah I was very lucky and actually I have I have here a copy of the paperback oh, which is yeah. the same but in as you can see yeah. in turquoise so that because with paperbacks they really want it to catch the eye in supermarkets so yeah. if you want something a bit more colorful so yeah I think they've done a brilliant job both times yeah yeah it looks superb and a hardback version as well the hardback looks like what's behind you. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, so there are, there are a few of those still sort of knocking around, and I'm hoping people might pick them up for Christmas because it's, you know, it's sparkly and it's a lovely thing to open on Christmas Day. So, yeah, there are a few yeah. around if people are looking for Christmas presents. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to carry on with the read. Got... Yeah, I hope you enjoy it. I mean, it, people tend to say to me, you know, I zipped through it, I read it in two sittings because yeah. it's... Yeah, it's quite a quick read. So, yeah, it probably won't delay you for very long, but I hope you like it. No, it's the best of delays. I think nothing better than, you know, reading yes. a book, especially, you know, yeah. page turner. Yeah, it is quite funny when people say, oh, I read it in two nights. And you think, oh, God, it took me four years to read. But I know it's, <laughs> it's a compliment, but it still feels yeah. quite weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah you, you, don't, you don't get fed up with, oh, I've got to finish that off. <laughs> yeah, exactly, get it done. yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, brilliant. The, the time's running down, and I think um, Zoom might kick me off in about a couple of minutes' time. But I yeah. enjoyed this chat, and I'm delighted yeah, to have uh, got in touch with it. We got mixed up, didn't we? I was calling there was another yes. similar name with Francis Quinn. <laughs> there's two of us. There are two, two Fran Quinn writers on Twitter, yeah, yeah. and then there's also the one who won Great British Bake Off, who I sometimes I, I, meet up with. <laughs> You kept getting every time I googled your name today, there was pictures of pies and cakes and no. things coming up. Oh, that's not fancy. No, I think it. it's going to take me a few books before I come up first on Google. But <laughs> <laughs>